Welcome. Good to have you here tonight. Uh, Mark, who normally introduces our speakers, is uh, at a convention this week, so he is gone. And I'm glad to introduce my cousin and brother, uh, <laughs> white hair, gray, grace. We, we dress accordingly, his wife said. Uh, many of you know Tom Mulholland. Tom is from the parish. Uh, Tom and his wife Angela and their family are, are great parishioners who are always here. Uh, Tom works in renewable energy. And because he does, uh, we ask him, Barb asked him, if uh, he would address some topic. Uh, and he said, well, what kind of topic? And she said, whatever topic you would like to talk about. Uh, from your background with renewable energy. So I'm going to let him tell you what he's going to talk about. When a couple of weeks ago, Father and I we were talking about this presentation, he gave me a couple of suggestions about it. And he said, first thing you need to do is not mix religion and science, and not mix religion and politics, and by all means, don't tell any Father O'Malley and Mrs. Antonelli's dog jokes. So I'm try not to do the third thing, but I will talk about science and mix religion and politics a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm Tom Mulholland. I've been uh, 35 years in the energy industry. I <clears throat> started at, uh, at an electric utility as sort of a sales guy. Ended up managing their state industrial and wholesale electricity sales groups. And I went to Colorado and started uh, I worked for a utility out there for a while, but then started up two businesses, uh, one for the utility and then one for myself, which was a, a consulting business in the area of commodity trading and risk management. So great introduction to the field. Uh, my company traded uh, about $300 million a year in, in commodity transactions, all kinds of transactions, fuels, electricity, natural gas, financial products, and so forth. And it gave me an introduction to, into pretty much all the different corners of the conventional utility supply system as well as the renewable energy supply system. And so from there, a number of years ago, uh, some colleagues and I decided we wanted to start a, a different venture. And so we started a, a renewable energy project development company. Um, that company has been a sponsor of uh, uh, NICFEST uh, a number of years now. So Carbon Cycle Energy is the name of it. And uh, you may have seen our names on the shirts. Um, so my background includes business development, uh, a lot of commodity work and so forth. Here, when, when Barb asked me to talk about renewable energy, the question I asked myself was, well, what would, what would anybody other than me, who's a total geek in this stuff, want to hear about? Uh, and so I thought, well, the context really is renewable energy, which is sort of a sub-part of environmental um, awareness, environmental uh, uh, sustainability which is sort of a subset of the church's teaching around nature and, and creation and so forth. But specifically, I don't know if you guys remember this, 2015, uh, uh, Pope Francis issued his encyclical, it's called Laudato Si. Uh, and that encyclical deals very critically and unflinchingly is a great word I think that applies to it, to the subject of environmental damage, and then what are we going to do about it? So he really throws down the gauntlet. So this talk tonight will really talk about three things, the, the encyclical and what it means in the context of the, the environment, the environment, and I'm going to limit my, my comments really to just mostly air emissions and so forth, and not talk about all the different areas of environmental uh, issues that we could get into. And then finally, just a bit about renewable energy, and we can get into it as much or as little as you like. So I'm going to try to keep it um, pretty informal and uh, high on graphic content, and not so much on me reading slides, because nobody wants that at 7 o'clock at night. Is that okay? Okay, so 
So we have three topics tonight. Can you guys see this okay? He's going to check the lights. Oh, okay. He's, he describes it as an ecology in crisis. Those are three really important words there. Ecology, we'll talk about what he means by that here shortly. But crisis, that word is striking, isn't it? The next thing is to talk about the environment, as we said. And then thirdly, renewable energy. So let's talk about this first piece. Pope asks us each very directly. What kind of world do we want to leave for our children? So we've heard this expression a lot. We're stewards of this planet for the generations that follow us. And he's, he's asking us very directly, are you aware of what's going on? Are you uh, planning a response to what's going on? What is that response? I expect you to get busy. So I, I told Father when in preparing this presentation and pulling out you know, juicy quotes to put in here from the encyclical, uh, if you go through it and, and you know, it starts to think for different terms, I search the word goal. And that, that word shows up 17 times in his encyclical. So the Pope is very, very goal-oriented goal and wants us to be goal-oriented too. Definable, actionable goals. Okay, so let's talk about what ecology means. This is three principles that he is addressing here in this, is, this encyclical. The first is, this concept of ecology, he goes into it at some length. The next is society, of course, in, in thinking about Christian teaching, we're thinking about our interaction as a society, what's good for society. And then finally, the economy. It's funny that you, you wouldn't think about the Pope um, speaking to subjects like the economy, but he does. He very much wants the world to develop and not have a first world, a second world, and a third world. He wants everybody to be in the first world and enjoy a high quality standard of living. So economy is very important to him from that standpoint. You can't end poverty is a key goal there. Um, but the other is, he clearly understands that if it doesn't work from an economy standpoint, it doesn't work at all. It's not really sustainable. So these really are the three pillars of sustainability. That word has a, an important meaning. To me, it means more durability than it does anything else. In, in our uh, political climate, we'll hear things about climate change and sustainability, and those become buzzwords that are, you know, you're either for that or you're against that. Uh, the Pope's asking us to set aside those, those preconceptions and to say, um, we have an obligation to take care of the poor. We need to address these things in a way that's durable. That's really the key message here. And the three elements of are the, uh, the uh, ecology, the society, and the economy that underpins it. Okay, so Catholic teaching has long talked about uh, these precepts, so there's not a lot new here. It's always talked about the environment. Uh, he's talking here in this particular thing about the ecology. What does that word mean? So I actually had to look this up when I read his encyclical to get what he was talking about. What is he talking about? So he's really talking about the interaction of humans to the rest of the natural world. The simplest way to put that. So it can't be just humans interacting with other humans. So we're thinking about the, the Pope and his teaching. Ordinarily it would be teaching between you know, human beings and their God human beings and other human beings. But here he's specifically saying those things are important and the third leg of that stool is your interaction with the natural world. So he's saying it's in crisis. And this is a quote from the encyclical. The earth herself burdened and laid waste is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. Man, that's a statement. It hits you right between the eyes. So when we talk about this being an unflinching um, encyclical, it is. He, he's not pulling any punches here. And then he also goes, goes out and lays some hope. He says, uh, we need to have a new dimension in our teaching. 
about uh, how to live in communion with God, but also with all creatures and with nature. He's saying specifically, we need to, to uh, make plans for including nature and not just shoving it aside as we have. So, a couple of things. He's demanding immediate action on all of our parts. Now, I said this was a 2015 encyclical. It's five years ago. So, what have you done for me lately is what he's asking. The second thing is, we want an integral approach here. This needs to include those three things that I talked about earlier, the society, the society, and the economy. How many in this room remember this advertising campaign? Probably everybody that's you know, older like me would remember this. This was a television and, and print media ad campaign. And for you guys that are younger, um, what it was was a, an Indian standing by the roadside and somebody goes by in a car and throws a bag of trash out of his feet and he cries over it. So my understanding as a 10 year old about what ecology meant was don't litter, don't throw a bag of trash out of a car window. But I, and so we thought if we were depositing that in a garbage can, we were doing our part and that's all we needed to do. But we didn't give any thought at all to the emissions of our automobile, the lead that was in the gasoline, or any of those other things. <laughs> because it was such a limited word, our understanding and our response was limited. <coughs> so, when you think about ecology in that context, with a limited vocabulary, we're going to have a limited response, a respectable response. But for me, personally, it kind of meant things like this. How did we use resources? You think about the old way of doing that, which is still pretty much the current way of doing that. <coughs> if you don't want it, throw it away. Well, okay, let's at least do some recycling, right? So that's become a, a very important, fashionable and important thing to do. The next is conservation. It used to be, uh, you know, if you think about the four major forests that were here in the United States at once upon a time, all of them were clear cut either in whole or in part at one point in time. So the entire lower peninsula of Michigan, for example, or Adirondack Park in New York State, these things were treated pretty rudely. Uh, you wouldn't see that in the same way today. Now, some places you can still find clear cuts, but it's, it's, not, it's not treated the same way. And then finally, water pollution. Uh, credit Richard Nixon for the signing of the uh, Clean Water Act during his tenure. Uh, Clean Water Act took the Cuyahoga River in, in uh, Cleveland, which once the river caught on fire, was so badly polluted, and is now comparatively clean. Now, we still have, uh, we have other problems to address, but it was a monumental change in the way that uh, the waters of the United States were managed. So, what we need to think about, though, is those issues on a global scale given the spread of our population. And that's what it looks like. You think about this. So for anybody that's a, a creationist, ignore the left-hand side of this chart. <laughs> anybody that's not. So if you, if you drew, actually drew this on a global time scale, it would look very much like a right angle. It would be just this abrupt eruption of human beings, which are in excess of 7 billion people now. Now, to think about that, in my lifetime, the population has doubled. In my dad's lifetime, it's quadrupled. That's a massive increase in people. And so that means the natural world is given a short shrift in that equation. It also means something pretty interesting thing, interesting to look in a second. The Anthropocene is the, the label that's been applied to it, the time of humans. That says something, very human-centric. Global impacts, but this this on the right changed so fast that humans don't recognize what was lost. You know, I can think back in, into my youth, um, fishing on one on this one particular stream, and it had a lot of willows that over, over overhung the, from the bank into the water. They aren't there now. Hedgerows on farms, they aren't there now. So the, these incremental changes are invisible to the generations that come behind us, and consequently the impact on. You know, for example, in central Illinois, where I grew up, quail were everywhere. There's not one to be had now. So we've had these impacts on the environment that are, because of the, the, the growth in human population and the spread across the planet, 
nature's been pushed aside and, and it has impacts. So humans have had sort of an entrenched approach here. These are all going to be pictures that we're very familiar with. Traffic jams, lots of houses. That one I think is an interesting picture. Uh, think about our food system and the chemicals that are applied to it. That, that picture is interesting because if you look in the upper right hand corner, there's actually a house there. So whatever we're putting on the bugs, we're putting on that group of people too. Not necessarily what you want. But the, the point of this slide is that when you look at that and you think about have we made room for nature in this life? Really not so much, okay? Systems designed for human needs and uh, lot, not a lot of concern for the natural world. So the stamp that you can put on that is the stamp that the Pope puts on it. It's a crisis. He's calling it a crisis. So there'll be several of these that look like that. The, the uh, image in the upper right hand corner is what I thought an interesting image, uh, you know, it's, God with some angels, and it almost looks like they're holding him back. I think he's kind of mad in this picture, which perhaps he is if you read the encyclical. So the, the Pope in this encyclical put these words, reestablishing the covenant. So he's saying there was a covenant, and you guys have broken it. So we need to reestablish that covenant. God saw everything that he had made, and it was very good. Really liked it. Good reason to like it. But then he goes on to say here, never have we heard and mistreated our common home as we have in the last 200 years. And he's pointing the finger directly at me, saying, you did it, and I have to agree. All right, the last thing he's asking here is, I want you to put some equilibrium back in the equation. What's that gonna look like? Okay, this is the next bit of Catholic teaching about this. The art of living together, or an emphasis on the word together. The right to development, the right to peace, and the right to a healthy environment. Now these are interesting to talk about, the, the, the right to development. The Pope never says, I want to stop development right now, capitalism is bad. He never says that. He says, you need to level, leaven capitalism with compassion. But what we need are efficient economies that work and serve people and that people can develop. He's not saying stop development, go back to the Stone Age and freeze in the dark. He's not saying that. He's saying also this right to peace. Peace is, you can think about peace as an absence of warfare. You can also think of it as a long-term stability in your environment. So if I was a fox living in a hole someplace, peace to me would be to be undisturbed. So let's think about peace in a different way. And the last, the right to a healthy environment. These are all right out of Catholic teaching. This is not Tom Mulholland talking about this stuff. It's just bringing it to everybody's today. So the next bit is about the environment. And this is really mostly about air emissions. Um, Father said don't put science in this, but I'm a geek, I have to, so there's some, there's some geeky slides in here. This one I, I think is, I love this slide. If you grew a tree in a pot, how much, how much weight would come from the soil? If you think about that, you don't have guys in the middle of the night schlepping bags of dirt and refilling the pots because the tree drank it down. So where is it getting that mass as it grows bigger and bigger? That thing is going to weigh tons in that pot. And the answer is real simple. It's seventh grade science. It's photosynthesis. So when you think about that, in every one of those leaves, there's a little tiny micro machine, or lots of them, actually scuds of them. And those things are converting, remember your seventh grade science, CO2 plus water equals oxygen and sugar. Well, the sugar is stored in a carbohydrate form in the plant, right? So carbon is, is part of carbohydrate. So it's taking its carbon from the air. So the weight in that pot, the increase in weight is all from the air, okay? Converting sunlight and air into biomass, biomass. So we all know what that is. It grows by photosynthesis. 
stores carbon, that is a stick of solid air. It's a different way of thinking about what a tree is. It's a stick of carbon air. So why am I talking about this in the context of Laudato C? Well, when we think about what drives renewable energy and the interest in renewable energy, it starts first and foremost with concern about the atmosphere, but also a recognition that almost every form of energy on the planet either does or once did come from sunlight. Fossil fuels all derived originally from sunlight. This is the storing of carbon in trees, and those trees died and they settled in the bottom of the ponds like that, were covered with sediments, and over millions of years became fossil fuels. CO2 is pulled out of the air, stored underground, so that there's something on the order of 10,000 billion tons of carbon stored underground. There's a lot of carbon from the atmosphere stored in rocks in a different way, but it's, it's not a fuel source and nobody cares about it. But fundamentally, what we're talking about here is solar energy was converted into an underground fuel, fuel delivery system. Now, what happens when you take that uh, I guess it was on a different slide. So 10,000 billion tons. What happens when, uh, if you look at this chart here, when you're pulling that out of the atmosphere, it's only just EE. -E. This part here is when the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is decreasing over millions and millions of years, 400 million years. And then it jumps back up again. So here, CO2 in the air is decreasing until we started using fossil fuels and then it goes the other way. What happens when you do that? What is the implication of tossing all that carbon back into the air? If I got 10,000 billion tons and I put it back into the atmosphere. So imagine I took Angela's nice car and I drove it into my garage and I closed the garage door behind me and I left the engine running. Bad things are gonna happen, right? It's just a matter of time and concentration. And so if I do the same thing in the atmosphere, eventually it fills up in the same way. Now there are different mechanisms to mitigate that, but the analogy holds. There is no free lunch in nature. And so if I'm burning that carbon, something, it goes somewhere. And it has reactions with the rest of the atmosphere. And that has its own implications. So here is the effect. It's the greenhouse effect. Now, Fossil fuels doesn't cause the greenhouse effect. What it does is it amplifies it. Our atmosphere has a greenhouse effect. That means sunlight coming through it, penetrates it, bounces off the surface, goes back into the atmosphere. Some shoots right back out into space and is dissipated. Some of that heat energy actually reflects off of the atmosphere and back down to Earth and is kept in here, keeping the planet somewhat warmer than it was. Okay, now if I increase the amount of carbon dioxide and some other greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide and methane being the other two primary ones, um, it'll increase the greenhouse effect and, and warm things up, both the atmosphere as well as the oceans. The oceans is a key part of this here. So this is very basic seventh grade science kind of stuff. So it does drive climate change and it's actually a lethal challenge to the ecology. Just like the analogy of me driving Angela's car into the garage and closing the door, that's fully, fully lethal. This is lethal also. It's in a different slow motion kind of way. So humans emit greenhouse gases. They build up in the atmosphere. They make the planet hotter. We were talking before the uh, speech tonight about the uh, fires in Australia. If you add up the uh, number of acres that were burned, it's on the order of about 60% of the state of Illinois. Think about that. Every single acre from, I don't know, say Decatur all the way to Cairo burned. And that's a lot of acres. It's unheard of, actually, in, in that place down there. And it's because of this kind of an effect. So these challenges that, that have to do with the atmosphere are all related and they cause effects with respect to the species, biodiversity. I actually was gonna put a slide up here about um, coral reefs. 
and it was just way too complicated. So this is limited to say biodiversity. Desertification, it's not dessert like pie, it's deserts. I like pie better. Uh, pollution, of course, we all know about pollution. Deforestation, climate change, the lots and lots of challenges. But the key point of this slide is they're interconnected. It's like a, a mobile that you used to have in your in your in your bedroom when you were a kid. You push on one piece and all the other pieces move. It's the same concept. The pieces are connected and they drive one another. Well, let's talk a little bit about renewable energy. So here's a question. What is the biggest source of energy on Earth and a huge part of our energy supply? Elizabeth, what is the answer to that question? Sun. Yeah, look on the slide. There's a picture there. We give you a hint. <laughs> it's actually it's actually two questions. This is a, a trick slide. The biggest source of energy on Earth is the sun, but it's not a big part of our picture. Most of our picture, this is global energy supply. It's everything. It's uh, transportation, it's um, electricity, heating, whatever. All of it um, is in this, in this category here. So worldwide, in 2017, that's what that picture looked like. So about 80% of it was fossil fuel derived, even though almost all energy comes from the sun. Either it originally did or it still does. Um. But we're doing better today. Yes, sir. David. Traditional biomass, what is that? Biomass is <coughs> traditional biomass. Traditional biomass is wood. Okay. Yeah, wood energy. Using tree trees to make electricity primarily. Thank you. Also for cooking. Okay, we're doing a lot better now, right? This is 2017. We're doing any better? We're not, actually. Over the last 20 years, you see the picture looks really very much the same. This is, uh, I added up the numbers earlier today, this is like 85% in 2000. In 2018, it was like, I don't know, 78% or something. So it's marginally different, but not very much different. So the Pope says we're in crisis, but we really are in stasis. We haven't changed anything in the last 20 years, despite lots of lines in the press and lots of arguments on television. Pretty much it's the same system that we've had. Right? We've cut coal in half. Actually, it wasn't by legislation so much as it was by market forces. Um, the reason has to do with natural gas got super cheap and it kind of crushed the coal market. The other thing that happened was uh, we relocated a lot of production from the Middle East to the United States. The United States became energy independent on the oil and gas side. It wasn't just 20 years ago. So we you know, made, made some changes in that way, but we haven't really fundamentally changed the way that we com comprise our energy system. So one important takeaway from this thing is the trend towards solar will accelerate. And people would say, you're not, you're not a forecasting guy, or and I'm not, but it's just really obvious to me that solar is gonna uh, be a huge part of the future. So back to the Pope, where are we headed without change? Climate change, one of the biggest challenges facing humanity. So he's really thrown down the gauntlet there saying, over the last 200 years, you've not done what you needed to do. And it's one of the biggest challenges still facing humanity. What are you gonna do about it? This last line here, um, we cannot rely on a superficial understanding of the ecology. We have to be serious and mature about this. This is a mature adult challenge and we can't be silly. We have to have a serious, real understanding of the ecology. And we can't pretend that doing nothing will change the outcome. Pretty sobering words from our book. So Barb, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. He asked me to talk about renewable energy instead of doing this preachy thing. But, but here's the next thing. Make a new start. Where can we go from here? So let's talk a little bit about renewable energy. So there are five uh, basic sources, mostly derived from solar. 
geothermal. This is the one that's not derived from solar. This is energy that's taken from the planet's crust in one form or another. The next is wave energy. Think about that. Waves are driven by wind and by, uh, by tides, but mostly by wind. And wind is driven by unequal heating and cooling on the planet's surface because of the sun. So it's indirectly a solar energy. Biomass, this is the creation of plants by photosynthesis. And those plants are decomposed or are burned in one way or another and become a fuel or become an energy source. Now this one is not problematic in terms of its carbon release because it's not a fossil fuel. It's not from underneath the ground. It's part of the ordinary rotation of carbon into the atmosphere and back into plants and over and over and over. And so it doesn't increase the uh, percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's actually what I do, the biomass part. Uh, wind generation, again, solar driven because of the, the cooling effects on the planet, heating and cooling. And solar power, which is direct conversion one way or another of solar energy. So let's talk a little bit about the grid. I'm going to talk about two things. One is the electricity grid, and the other is transportation systems. So right now, the electricity supply uh, looks like that on the left. That's the history of it from 1950 to uh, about 2018, I think, is when that chart was printed. And you can see on the bottom there are a lot of it was coal. Uh, a lot, excuse me, a lot of our electricity in the United States was coal derived. It was about 80% or so in the, in the late 80s. And that number has slowly dropped off for two reasons. One is the coal-fired power plants that were put on to produce that electricity got old, and it was pretty, pretty expensive to maintain them. Um, people decided it was a lot cheaper for a whole bunch of reasons to build a gas turbine, a natural gas-fired turbine, to produce electricity than a coal-fired power plant. A lot less expensive, a lot less risky, easier to get permitted, and so forth. And natural gas got cheap, and so coal as its percentage of the market share really dropped just because the technology was sort of old and wasn't competitive anymore. Natural gas took off, became a big part of it. Um, petroleum a lot less. Hydro stayed pretty flat. What I mean by hydro is damming of rivers and, and generation of electricity by having the water run over the dam. And then renewables, of course, are starting to take off, and they're going to take off in a pretty significant way. So this is a map, this kind of shows, it shows two things. First, in the last 20 years, renewable uh, uh, requirements that states have imposed on their utilities to have renewables as part of their electricity supply have increased all over the country. But you'll notice it's pretty balkanized. It's, it's not uniform, really, in any way. First of all, not all the states have any kind of a requirement. And the second, it's not uniform as to what it is. But there are a number of states out there, I think there are seven right now, that have a renewable energy requirement on the electricity side that we will be 100% renewable by X date. Um, Colorado, I think that date is 2040. By 2040, it's going to be 100% renewable. And the utility actually declared that. The state didn't. Uh, the state of California, the state of Hawaii, New York State, there are a number of them that have adopted these pledges. Other ones, um, for example, in North Carolina, that number is 12%. Seems pretty small. But North Carolina has a huge renewable, um, renewable project uh, investment cycle going on down there. And so it doesn't take a lot to really change things. For example, in North Carolina, Duke Energy, the utility, has put 3,000 megawatts of solar um, systems in just to meet that 12% requirement. And that's the equivalent of three Prairie State coal-fired power plants that are over here at Marissa. I mean, that's, that's a lot of power generation from sun, and they did it just to meet a comparatively small requirement. And so the, the point of the slide is to say, um, over time, the mix was a lot of coal that's already started to change because of market forces. And now as the states implement these different criteria for themselves, it'll simply accelerate that, that 
uh, changing of the guard, if you will, from the old assets that produce that electricity to a new form of asset. Okay. The one thing that's notably missing from, his, from this is a federal standard. There is no federal standard. The federal government has never said, we're going to have X amount of renewable, we're going to totally get behind this. Whether they should or shouldn't is really not my business. I just want to make the point that our Pope is saying we need to do something, uh, but, but you know, of course, the different states are not on board with that, and the federal government's not on board with that. Let's talk about geothermal and what that is. So what this means is you find a place where there is a combination of things. First, uh, uh, volcanic activity that's below the surface and comparatively close to the surface where water finds its way down to that volcanic activity and it gets hot enough that it comes back up as hot water or steam. And when you, when you do that, then you can actually run that steam through a, a steam turbine and produce electricity, just like a coal-fired power plant would, except we're not burning any fuel. We're just harvesting the steam directly from the earth. Really, really cool technology. There just aren't a lot of projects like that. Um, the place where we as consumers might run into this is in something like a heat pump, where you have a heat pump that uh, takes its energy from the atmosphere, or more efficiently from uh, a, a water loop that's embedded in the ground and circulates in the ground and takes uh, warmth out of the ground and puts it into your house. It's very efficient, very cheap, and the one thing that it is, it's all electric. And so if you think about an electric future, a solar-driven future, uh, the electricity doesn't have any carbon footprint, and neither does your HVAC system. So it's, it's a way of just thinking about the problem fundamentally differently, which is what the Pope's asking us to do. <clears throat> electricity or future. Wave energy. Now, that thing there on the right looks awful big compared to the little scuba divers. It's actually just because it's close up. But what that is is a, one of many, many kinds of of uh, uh, machines that capture the motion of the waves and, and use it as sort of a piston to turn a shaft that creates electricity just like sort of the reverse of your automobile. Um, lots of potential for this kind of thing because uh, oceans cover so much of the planet's surface. It's in early stages and if you Google wave energy systems like this you'll find scuds of different um, technologies out there. <clears throat> so for young people that are interested in renewable energy as a career, both on the technical side and the business side, all kinds of opportunities here. This is biomass. Really, three places, David, to your question earlier about wood energy. Wood energy is a form of it. Um, biofuels, typically we're thinking about ethanol and the conversion of, of grains into uh, fuels. or um, conversion of biomass, either uh, food products or um, farm waste, manure especially, that are converted through anaerobic digestion, which is what those tanks are. Uh, those are full of, of a liquid that has um, food waste in it, and it's made into a slurry, and it's pretty thin actually. It's not a lot uh, more thick than, say, a, oh, like, a, like a Guinness beer would be you know, kind of that thickness. Um, and what's in there are the same microbes that are in a person's stomach. It's actually what's in a cow's stomach, and those microbes convert, they do the reverse of photosynthesis. They break down the food energy that's in there, the sugar that's in there, and they'll produce a solid waste that can be used as fuel, but they'll also produce uh, biogas, which is a renewable form of natural gas. It doesn't contribute to the um, CO2 problem in the atmosphere and the greenhouse effect. And um, consequently, it's completely green. It's, so if you think about our food system, <clears throat> that head of lettuce that's sitting in your refrigerator, before it got there, there were only there were, there were 10 that were produced. One went into your refrigerator, one went into the neighbors. The other eight were wasted. <clears throat> that's very much, that's the case across the food system. About 80% of it never makes it into a, a person's, onto their plate. It's wasted. Now you think about all the energy inputs that went into that, the growing side, the transportation, the processing. Every food product that's on your table traveled on average 800 miles to get there. That's a lot of energy wasted. And so if you think about 
can we recover that? Can we reduce the transportation footprint? Can we reduce the agricultural footprint? There's a lot that goes into that. So the point of this slide, and I think it's a, it's a, a paradigm shifting kind of a thought, plants are basically batteries. That grapefruit sitting in your refrigerator is a battery. It has a bunch of solar energy stored up inside of it. Now, that could be taken back out. It can be used to make zero carbon emission uh, energy and fuels directly. Wind energy, we've all seen these. People will say, man, that's a cool technology, or man, that's an eyesore. And there's really not much between those that you'll hear. My sister lives next to a wind farm. She hates the thing. She despises it. But they're here to stay, and we're going to see lots and lots of these things. Each one of those machines at the top will produce two or 3,000 kilowatts of energy. And you think about that, that's two or 3,000 homes that it can power by itself. That's a lot. These things are powerful. <coughs> it's about 5% of global electricity supply, 10% of the US, and about 15% of European, no emissions. Um, the output varies, and you can't store it. You can't store electricity like you can other things, unless you have a battery, and that part's coming. So it is a, uh, an important part of the solution here. Uh, consumers can buy wind energy right now. You can sign up uh, through your utility, typically, to do that. And what happens is there's a bit of the money that you go to uh, buy the electricity. A bit of that money is uh, uh, allocated to the developers to build these projects and pay them off under long-term contracts. So if you're a developer, you, you put together uh, a farm of these things that has, I don't know, a couple hundred units like this, stretched out over miles and miles, and they all go together into one financing package that's then sold to the utility under a long-term term contract. You know, people subscribe to it or it's made part of your bill just by regulation. And then, uh, then the supply hits the system. And the, the interesting thing about it is this stuff used to be really expensive. It's not anymore. And that's one of the reasons that coal kind of fell by the wayside. Um, this energy, because of financing costs, went down as is very competitive with the market price for electricity produced by other sources. Solar, same thing. These things um, used to be Jimmy Carter, you know, talking about putting one on the roof of the White House, and then you know we had individuals putting them on their houses, and then those got ugly and didn't work anymore, and so they yanked them all off. Well, now utilities got back in the business of putting these in in mass and scale. And so just like wind, uh, the solar industry has found a way to take a pretty simple technology, scale it up by putting a whole bunch of it together in one project, getting project financing through a finance industry that is now accustomed to this, and now they can package this stuff and it's competitive. So the, the cost of this has come from astronomical down to quite competitive. <clears throat> this will become a dominant energy source. Um, Everything from small installations to utility scale. Um, you can do this at home, or you can buy it through your utility. And, and because I was in the trading side of this, you don't necessarily have to buy it from your utility. There are lots of people that can sell you these products, and they're real. You can say, well, I bought a thing to sort of greenwash my conscience. And, and make me feel better about it, but it didn't really bring generation onto the grid. Well, yes, they do. These things are real. Okay. Most new power plants are now renewable, plus seven. That wasn't true, you know, a decade and a half ago. Most of it was natural gas powered, as I said before. They were very easy to put huge machines online pretty cheaply and without a lot of risk. And when you push a button, they start up run on natural gas, a lot of natural gas, and uh, produce um, fossil-derived but relatively clean electricity. Those are being replaced now with um, solar farms and uh, wind farms in large part. Another gas plants going in and still some coal plants. Uh, for example, in 2011, that's when, I think it was 2011, when Prairie State came on in our neighborhood over here, that plant will run for 30 years in all likelihood. Um, so, but not very many coal plants going on anymore. The days of those um, coming
going on just because of the market forces are probably <coughs> over. The fastest growing thing is wind, and you'll see, you know, it's really ramped up in the last decade. <coughs> What's right behind it is that golden part, that's the solar part. That part is really starting to take off, solar is. So I expect wind to sort of plateau. That, that's really not a chart that you could extrapolate out into the future and expect it to stay like that. Solar is really gonna have a big impact here. Let's talk about transportation for a few minutes. Electric vehicles, everybody recognizes this one, right? about electric vehicles. Now, there's really a lot of things good to say about Tesla. One of them is, originally the concept of an electric vehicle was probably brought to mind something like a Yugo, not a Tesla. Tesla has really shaken the industry up with their model. And of course, now we have lots of problems. Everybody piled on after Tesla got into the act. So electric vehicles will replace an internal combustion engine vehicles. They just will. Industri ICE engines are dinosaurs and eventually will be replaced either by hybrids or just full electrics. Um, even the mining industry, that is an all electric mining truck. But it's just cool. Another thought about Tesla, I'm not a, a Tesla advertising machine, but I, res I have to respect their thinking. There's their vehicle again. But they also have, a, a part of their company produces solar panels and will install them for you, they'll finance the thing, they'll put in the whole thing. They also produce uh, storage systems. So they've given you one-stop shopping to have uh, a vehicle that runs on electricity, it's charged right at your house, you never have to go to the filling station again. You can run your house on this. You can put in enough storage so that uh, your house runs completely off the grid. And if you want extra storage so that if you, have, if you are connected to the grid or you have an outage, you can go for a week or more just running off your battery system. Same AC because it has the technology to change it from DC into AC. Everything in your house runs just like it did. I'm not saying this is inexpensive. I'm not saying that. Um, but it's not unreasonable either. There is, a, there is a payback to be had here, but if you consider the, the more global economic costs of not doing something like this, it's a bargain. So what Tesla offers is a paradigm shift, a different way of thinking about the whole problem. They weren't content to say, we'll sell you a vehicle and then we're done with it. The, the reason that Apple people buy Apple products is they offer a bunch of, of uh, technologies that integrate well together, a whole family, or a whole suite of technologies, and Tesla took that same approach. <clears throat> so they're rethinking electric, uh, energy supply at the domestic level. Autonomous vehicles, you'll notice that bus has no driver, but it has you know, a guy that's about to get on it. Right? That is an autonomous electric vehicle. So it's interesting. It's combining two technologies now, renewable technology and artificial intelligence. Now we think about artificial intelligence only in a negative connotation. It will automate jobs away and so forth. And that's true. But it's also going to create a lot of jobs and a lot of synergy. But more importantly, it's an opportunity to, to use technologies in a way that um, preclude some of the downsides that otherwise would attend to them. So we can't be shy about that. We have to think about uh, appropriate ways to do that. This slide is about rethinking local transportation. It's not rethinking the automobile, but take one step back and think about transportation in general. Um, some people will tell you that 75% of local traffic in the future will be on buses like this, where it's common transportation and not individual transportation, because there's so much, um, so much asset sitting in your garage that's used only 5% of the time. So another way to, to actually decrease everybody's carbon footprint is not have so much steel and plastic and everything else sitting in your garage that goes unutilized for most of its lifetime. Let's do that in a more um, 
a more social way. So we're thinking about the social aspect of things, the economy aspect of things, the ecology aspect of things. They come together in a concept like that. Aviation. Okay. 30 major airlines have undertaken a program to <coughs> substitute renewable fuel for conventional aviation fuel. That will move the market. When you have 30 big companies like that, now they're not all saying, tomorrow I'm making a 100% switch to renewable fuel. They aren't saying that. They are saying, <clears throat> I can run a flight that's 50% conventional fuel and 50% food material converted into fuel. fuel. We can run a plane on that. We can do that safely without any kind of fuel degradation in flight or in storage, either one. We can do it safely with today's equipment. So it's called a drop-in fuel. Drop it into the existing uh, systems. Another way that we can think about this is passengers, every time you buy an airline ticket, most of the progressive airlines will offer you the opportunity to buy a carbon offset. And you'd think to yourself, why would I pay an extra 10 bucks for that greedy uh, airline? And you may be right to think about it that way. Another way to think about it is, am I buying a, a piece of paper that says my fuel is carbon free and I'm greenwashing my conscience? You could think about it that way. <clears throat> but actually, if we spend the money and create a market for carbon offsets, what carbon offsets do, they pay for projects that don't produce necessarily renewable fuel. What they do is they they fund a project that may reduce emissions that are harmful to the atmosphere that don't produce a fuel. Let me give you an example of that. Um, if I'm a pig farmer and I have a lagoon, I have a barn full of animals, and every day I pull a chain on two big tanks inside the barn and a bunch of water rushes underneath where the animals stand and it washes all the manure out down a pipe and into a pond and there it sits. And it, of course, it smells bad and it's gross. But what it does inside, there are all those microbes that were once in the animal's digestive system, they're now inside that manure in the pond, and they continue to act on the food that's left inside that waste stream. And so they'll produce methane. They'll produce methane that's the equivalent of natural gas. Methane's a greenhouse gas, and released to the atmosphere is 25 times worse than carbon dioxide. So it's a bad actor. Well, if I put a cover over the top of that lagoon and I capture that methane, I can actually collect it together and take it to market as a renewable natural gas product, or I can simply burn it. I just burn it right there if it's too expensive to get it into the pipeline. And at least what goes into the atmosphere now is carbon dioxide and not methane, which is really harmful. So carbon offset products like this, you may think it's a form of greenwashing, and it kind of is, but it actually pays to get work done to prevent pollution sources in the real world. And I'm very much in favor of this sort of thing. Okay. Another thing to keep in mind here in the renewable space is that it's full of innovation. Uh, Tesla, uh, all these different companies that we've been talking about, or that I could talk to you about ad nauseum, um, there's a lot of innovation there, a lot of room for uh, brilliant scientists and brilliant business people and people that are interested in design. Uh, but there, there's room for a lot of stuff. And so think creatively. We don't have to go back to the Stone Age, and it doesn't have to be in something that's not cool. So think about that. I actually blew it on that slide. Let me do that again. Ah, that doesn't automatically make you do it wrong. There it is. That is a personal helicopter. Just think about that. You know, th it, 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 there was a lot of criticism 10 years ago about when I was a kid, I, just, I dreamed of having a flying car, and instead I've got Twitter with, you know, 140 characters. That's what innovation got me. So, you know, there's a, a lot of, you know, recrimination over that. But the notion here is that, that transportation can be thought of much, much differently. Um, instead of having a vehicle in my garage that runs on a paved road, maybe I want one of these little babies and I can jump in and fly to mass. And because those things are not only cool, and Father would love to have a bunch of them in his parking lot, but they're also all electric. These things are all electric. Rethinking aviation. Now you notice here I propounded this theme 
a number of times, rethinking, 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 rethinking. So the Pope is saying to us, there's a crisis. It demands action. You have to rethink things. But it doesn't have to be a drag. It can be really cool. Hydrogen. This is a really interesting one, I think, as a renewable fuel. This is in its early stages. The idea here is to convert water into a fuel. <clears throat> think Hindenburg. <laughs> Hindenburg was full of hydrogen. It caught fire like nobody's business. Well, it's an unfortunate accident, and I'm not trying to make light of it, but I am saying hydrogen burns. It's a great fuel. The problem is, it takes a lot of energy to convert water to hydrogen that's a usable fuel source. And the way that you do that is either by burning a bunch of fossil fuels and cooking hydrogen water under pressure and separating the elements that way. You don't want to do that because you're releasing so much carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, it's really counterproductive. The other way to do it is to do it with electrolysis. So if you have excess electricity, so think about all the power plants that produced during the daytime to meet all that uh, requirement when everybody is awake. They can be shut off at night. Well, what if it's wind? You, can, you don't need to shut it off. You can take the electricity and put it into something like this. So while we're sleeping, it's producing a fuel all by itself. Now take that fuel <clears throat> and do something with it. It's a potential transportation fuel with extended range. So think about <clears throat> think about your Tesla. Those things run, I don't know, you get 400 miles out of the fill up now, out of the most recent models. So I can get halfway across Kansas. I would argue that's not near enough Kansas to get across, but uh, you get halfway across Kansas, right? Okay, so you, you want to extend that fuel range so you're not stuck in Kansas while you're refilling your automobile. Hydrogen solves that problem because you can put a tank on a vehicle and do that. The way that you convert hydrogen to uh, power at the wheels is actually through an electric generation process. You run it through a fuel cell, which converts it to electricity, and electricity then drives the wheel. Really cool technology. And there's an example that's on the road. That thing that looks like a sleeper behind the driver is actually not. There's no sleeper on this thing. That's a fuel cell. So on this vehicle is uh, fuel storage and then a fuel cell that converts it to electricity and then turns those wheels just like it would on an electric car. <clears throat> You'll see those on a highway coming near you. So, where do we start? This is the action slide. How do you take action on this stuff? You, I've talked to you about all kinds of different ideas and I haven't said very much about where an individual can get started. <clears throat> is, I think this is a really interesting slide. The very first <clears throat> slide that I put up here was about what kind of a world do we want to leave those who come after us? <clears throat> and here, the author of this particular website, I grabbed this uh, graphic off of a Catholic website, included that same quote, thinking it was probably the most powerful one. I, I agree. I thought it was the most powerful one, too. But what the, what the Catholic Church is doing is trying to mobilize a billion, 200 million people to get after it. And this is just a sample of uh, Catholic organizations that are dedicated to climate change and to the effects that come from it. <clears throat> Think about this for just a second. Who is the biggest renewable energy purchaser in the world? Now, last week, uh, Google's parent, Alphabet, announced that it had invested in a huge, I don't remember if it was a wind farm or a solar farm, but it was a huge project. I think it was wind. And they said, we're the biggest. And they're not, actually. They said, we have 1.6 gigawatts of uh, electric generation capacity under contract that we have paid to develop, essentially. But the one that's bigger than them, by a factor of three, is the United States Department of Defense. The Department of Defense is the biggest consumer of renewable energy in the world. And the reason is they're very, very concerned about the dislocation of human populations that come about as a result of climate change. And they said, 
we're going to actually, we're going to do our part, number one, we're going to be prepared to take action as a military force. That's part of our, ch our charter. So they're the biggest. What they're saying is, the, the underlying thing, we expect millions of people to be dislocated, hundreds of millions of people to be dislocated as a result of climate change. Now, that graph that I put up early in this presentation about the Anthropocene and the, the, the population growth over 7 billion, that's brought about largely because a very clever German scientist in the 30s figured out a process called Fischer Tropes. And what it does is it converts natural gas or coal into other forms of, of uh, usable fuel like gasoline or in this case, converts it into anhydrous ammonia. So you can take natural gas and convert it into fertilizer. So the reason that there are so many people is there's a lot of food. We have created a food supply that nourishes those people. So here's a question. If there's a, a complete ban of fossil fuel use, what happens to the number of people on the planet? Half of them probably are challenged to have enough food in their diet. So it's a huge implication and it's not a simple question. It's not simple at all. But we as Catholics are being asked to address climate change in the context of those sort of questions. Just an example of sustainable farming. Sustainability initiatives, what kind of form do they take? Um, Angela and I were at a conference a while back at Notre Dame, and one of the speakers was Paul Hawken. I don't know if you guys remember Smith and Hawken, the people that sold um, interesting hardware and so forth. How we got, you know, their their mail in the 80s and 90s. Well, Paul Hawken was one of was the Hawken side of Smith and Hawken. He's become a very outspoken uh, advocate of sustainability initiatives, and he put together this interesting thing called Project Drawdown. The idea here was to um, publicize sustainability initiatives in all different corners of people's lives and sort of sort those in terms of the importance that could have on the impact on, on climate change and, and carbon sequestration. So here's his list. I actually have his book that right here if anybody wants to look at it. Inside the book, he has the Pope's encyclical. He had an article right about it. And the word that he used to describe it was unflinching. Again, that word. So in this book, on this website, on countless other websites like it, are lists of initiatives that people can, can uh, find out about and become involved in. And they range from very simple things like turning off your lights all the way to you know becoming a project developer or getting into renewable farming or, or whatever. Lots of really interesting things. This is just one example. Restoration project. It's called the Trillion Trees Initiative. This one is sort of um, not political at all from the standpoint of uh, this is the guy that was the founder of Salesforce.com. He's behind this. What he wants to do is plant a trillion trees worldwide, which arguably would soak up about 25% of the excess carbon that we need to take out of the atmosphere that we put there by using fossil fuels. So that gives you an idea of the scale of the problem. A trillion trees to get that done. That's a thousand billion. That's a lot of trees. Remove the CO2 from the air. That can be done by individuals, institutions, policymakers, all of it. So, again, the Pope in the encyclical wrote the word goals 17 times. He's interested in how do we measure success. He's quite interested. I think this is a thing worth reading here. He wants an awakening of a new reverence for life. The quickening of the struggle for justice and peace and the joyful celebration of life. The dare to turn what is happening to the world into our own personal suffering and thus to discover what each of us can do about it. He's making a challenge directly to us. Restore ecological equilibrium within ourselves, with others, with nature, other living creatures, and with God. So again, it's that tripartite concept of Man to God, man to man, 
and other living creatures. All three parts. Don't ignore them. Limit the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere. That's a quote right out of the encyclical. You think about these as being um, theological and so forth, and they are. But they're also really, really grounded in science. It's not antithetical to religion at all. Eliminate poverty. Big theme in this was poverty. The dislocation of people and the Department of Defense's whole investment and so forth is directly aimed at this concept. We're not going to forget those who are most vulnerable to climate change. We're going to actively address climate change and take care of those people who are dislocated by it. And finally, make the leap toward the transcendent. He sees this as a personal, personal transcendence sort of issue that really speaks to what is our life here on this planet all about. And, um, are we fulfilling our mission and our reason for being here on the planet in the first place? Leave behind a testimony of selfless responsibility. That's it. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas, thank you. This man is a wealth of knowledge, is he not? Wonderful presentation. Other questions? Mike. Yeah, can you give us uh, some details about your company, what it does? Sure. My mom always used to ask me that question, Mike. Yeah, I'd give her the answer and she'd say, say that again. describe <laughs> it? My, my company develops biogas projects and what we do is we put together a project to build anaerobic digesters. The idea is to take in industrial food waste, that waste is converted into renewable natural gas and that's sold to utilities under long-term contracts so that they can make renewable electricity from it. It was a very simple, um, straightforward process, it, but uh, it, it steps in the middle of that food waste chain and instead of those, those materials going either into a landfill, which causes problems, but the other thing that they do is they make it into kind of a, a smoothie. They spread it out over farm fields, which is gross, and you don't want to know any more about that. And so you take those materials and put them in a nice, clean anaerobic digester. It looks like a, kind of like a grain bin. And it produces methane. Yep. So that's what I do. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you see uh, nuclear surviving as a viable energy source, considering the nuclear waste and the uh, safety issues? Yeah, I, I, I think so. The, you know, there are a number of operating plants that. Uh, the operators have continued to try to extend their lives. Um, it is a zero carbon emitter, and consequently, people want to keep them around. The environmentalists are for it from the standpoint of, look, the contamination within the plant is already there. Let's keep the thing operational. The real issue is, what do you do when the thing shuts down? There is no permanent home for the waste. So, you know, that's the, the question that blocks really the development of new capacity. There are a number of people that would very much like to build more nuclear facilities here in this country and have applied for permission to do that, but the issue is they haven't um, figured out what to do with the waste and that doesn't look like that will happen anytime soon. Yes, sir? One of the problems with wind and solar is that it's in places where we don't need the electricity. It's on the eastern range, or it's in the desert southwest. How do you get it to the population centers? Is that, are we any closer to providing for that transportation of the energy and the electricity? Uh, the answer is yes. What, what we'll do is inject it into the existing electricity grid, so you don't have to replicate that. <clears throat> so the, the developers have mapped out wind energy resources by 
strength of the wind, but also prevalence. It just has to blow all the time. Um, oddly enough, if you put a wind generator in a place that where there's really strong wind, everybody considers it to be ideal, it's still going to produce only about 30% of the time. So there's a lot of time it's just not doing much. That's, that's okay. It's just a natural uh, occurrence. But, but your question is, are they located where the population centers? If I could rephrase what you said, and the answer is generally yes. There's a lot of wind generation here in the Midwest. It's, it's pretty windy. It's, uh, you don't want it to be super windy because that tears the machines up. You don't want it to be too little or too intermittent. So a nice steady 10 mile an hour wind is perfect. Think Iowa. And there's a lot of wind generation in Iowa. And so what the utilities have done is built some, they've reinforced this, the electric grid to, to create um, solid pathways to the markets where the population is the highest. And that's really, for the most part, already been accomplished and it's ready for it. The, the, the interesting thing on the solar side is that this, the uh, solar cells have gotten so much more efficient, they'll produce quite a lot actually when the sun's not doing very much. So you can have solar cells pretty much any place and still make good progress with it. All right, thank you. Tom, thank you again. I think what uh, many of us are feeling tonight is uh, the wonderful gift that I thought Tom brought is he pulled together uh, this vision that Pope Francis has in Laudato Si and really invited us to, to take what the Pope is saying and then with his notions of renewable energy and so many other areas to make it very practical to say, you know, we may not know what to do tomorrow morning, but there are things going on that say, this is not some pipe dream out in the air, that this is real. And if we commit ourselves to this uh, taking seriously what the scripture says, that we are stewards of the earth and that we are stewards of the environment um, to make sure that, um, you know, that people don't just write off Pope Francis as one pope who is caught up in the environment, but that this is very much a scriptural thing, that this is very much right out of the book of Genesis, that it's our responsibility to take care of the earth, and I think Tom is giving us wonderful directions in which we can go. So thank you again, Tom. <laughs>